Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us for the first of the afternoon spotlight sessions. Uh, they're designed to allow dialogue and interchange between people who wouldn't normally come together. So practitioners, ministers, civil society organizations. We've got some of those on the stage with us from all over the world as well. This session is entitled Scaling Up, Reaching Millions, Not Hundreds of Girls. Experiences in Scaling Up Community-Led Social Change. We have experts here from government, from research institutions and civil society, and they're going to present a broad array of experiences representing Asia, Africa, and the United Kingdom. They're building on the session that took place in this very room this morning, and we're going to look at the critical work of stimulating change from within communities to end female genital mutilation and child early and forced marriage. The specific issues we're going to be covering today are around how to ensure that policy and programme interventions reach beyond the hundreds and thousands that uh, are currently being reached to millions of girls and women affected by these practices. On this very stage, the British Prime Minister a short while ago uh, told us that some 130 million women around the world are at risk of gen female genital mutilation. So I'm going to start by introducing our, our, our speakers and invite them to come, and then we'll get through the speakers as we go rather than introduce them all now. They've each been asked to stick to about five minutes. Uh, some of them will have slides as well. And then if we don't get through their entire presentations in that time, then you'll have a chance to ask them questions at the end. But we are already pressed for time, so I just want to bear that in mind. So with that, let me bring invite our first speaker up to, uh, to speak. She's Sonali Khan. She's the Vice President of Breakthrough Initiative, which produces mass media campaigns aimed at confronting and changing social norms. And she's going to be talking about uh, their Nation Against Early Marriage campaign, which challenged men and boys to see their women and girls as productive members of the household. Sonali. So I carry the burden of numbers. I mean, we were reminded in the morning that the largest number of cases of early marriage and child marriage are from India. So it is just imperative that we work at scale. Otherwise, the kind of numbers we are talking about, the number of girls that are vulnerable to actually getting married off early, we will never be able to reach them with small uh, work at the district level, at the village level. Though those are so important, and that community conversation is essential, but if we are not able to scale up, the whole question of urgency uh, will not be met, and we will be working against time, and these girls will just be lost to the issue that we are really uh, working on. So, Everybody here understands the causes of early marriage, but just to contextualize it a little bit for you, uh, in, in, in the India context, parents really feel that they're working for the good of their girl by getting her married early. It's not something wrong that they're doing. The girl in her position in, is in no position to complain against the parents. Uh, there are no official complaints. In the states of Bihar and Jharkhand, where we are working, Girls do not formally complain uh, and go to the law when they are faced with the issue of early marriage. They keep quiet. So in this kind of a context, in this kind of a reality, how do you create impact? How do you work? The most critical part for us to think about is that this is a social issue. Marriage is a social issue, so it needs a social response. It needs the community to step up and say no early marriage and child marriage is unacceptable because in only this way will that girl find the confidence to raise her voice because at the end of the day, it is about girls and that's why we have the Girls Summit. It's about girls' right and that is what Malala so beautifully in the first session actually said, that we are not asking for charity, we are asking for our rights and that's where uh, we really need to step up and when those girls step up, what is the kind of support that the community is going to provide those girls? We are, while we are working in Bihar and Jharkhand, we have created a programming for scale. Uh, we are working right at the community level, mobilizing, but we have created a mass media campaigning strategy which allows us to reach millions as we speak. It's really important to understand that this problem needs a scale approach, a scale approach that works. It's not about just putting some good intention out there. It's really also understanding what works. At Breakthrough for the last three years, Breakthrough is the organization that I represent and we are a human 
rights organization that is working on the issue of early marriage in two of the most difficult states of India, Bihar and Jharkhand, which really have the largest number of early marriage, where we have realized that unless you operate at scale, you will not make a difference. Through our previous campaigns against domestic violence, we realized that you can really shift the national dialogue. You can bring attention to an issue that people would rather deny. Our work on domestic violence, where we first recognized the co-relationship between domestic violence and early marriage, where young girls came up to us and said that we are facing a uh, physical violence, mental violence, we had no, they had no rights to any health re related issue. And then our field level staff said that we really need to build up a bottom up program to address the issue of early marriage. Then began our journey in Bihar and Jharkhand. We have been running campaigns here, mass media campaigns, but the biggest part of this is, I mean, the expectations have been clearly articulated, but along with it, we are running a ra an evidence-based um, program where we are using randomized control trial where we are bundling up our interventions using community mobilization, media, using uh, training and media, and just media alone to understand what really shifts the, the discourse in the community and what can we offer as solutions for scale. At the end of the day, you're putting millions of dollars, and we all know we've put millions of dollars into food programs, into anti-poverty programs, into livelihood programs, but that necessarily hasn't improved our lot. So when we put in all this money, we really need to see the change. And for that, Breakthrough has really invested along with our research agency on a very robust mechanism. And we are really, uh, more or less, have collected data from over 3,000 families. We are, uh, at the end of this year, we will have a midline and end of 2017, we will be having an endline survey. And hopefully, we can present to you what works and doesn't work. So thank you. <laughs> Sonali, thank you very much. I should just point out there's a giant clock counting down for the speakers here, which is why they might rush towards the end. But thank you very much. We'll pick up some of the points in the question section. Uh, our next speaker will be speaking in French. So you have headsets for translation. Uh, channel one or two for, for English? I'm not quite sure. One, I think, for English. Le prochain présentateur, c'est Monsieur Adama Njai, secrétaire général de la Ministère de la Famille en Senegal. In Senegal, the Secretary General of the Ministry of the Family, Mr. Adama Njai. Uh, he's going to talk about the National Plan of Action. Il va parler au sujet du, du Plan d'Action National. Uh, the innovation of this plan was the adoption at scale of a human rights-based approach to addressing the practice and promoting community development. Uh, Monsieur Njai, s'il vous plaît. Je vous remercie, Monsieur le Moderateur, de me donner l'opportunité de parler de l'exemple du Sénégal en matière de lutte contre les mutilations génitales féminines. La promotion de l'abandon de l'excision constitue un objectif majeur de la politique du gouvernement du Sénégal. Selon les résultats de l'enquête démographique et santé de 2010-2011, 26% des femmes âgées de 15 à 49 ans ont été excisées à l'échelle nationale contre 28% en 2005. Le taux de prévalence connaît des disparités au niveau régional. À Dakar, il est passé de 17 à 20 %, alors que l'enquête démographique et santé continue de 2013 révèle que la prévalence chez les enfants de 0 à 14 ans est de 18 %, avec une disparité selon les tranches d'âge. Donc, depuis 1970, Le gouvernement s'est engagé à mettre fin à cette pratique en collaboration avec les associations de défense des droits des femmes, de la société civile, des parlementaires, des jeunes et des leaders religieux. En vue d'optimiser ces résultats, le gouvernement s'est doté d'un plan d'action bâti sur des principes directeurs et une vision soucieuse du respect des droits fondamentaux des femmes. La vision de ce plan d'action et d'atteindre l'abandon total de l'excision pour créer au Sénégal un environnement protecteur des droits des filles et des femmes qui leur assure une bonne santé, un maintien de leur intégrité physique et le respect de tous leurs droits. Il y a des principes directeurs qui sous-tendent ce plan d'action et ils sont au nombre de quatre. C'est la responsabilisation des communautés, c'est l'approche basée sur les droits humains, c'est la stratégie coordonnée, c'est la gestion axée sur les résultats. 
Et parmi les résultats, le ministère de la Femme et de la Famille, qui assure la coordination avec l'appui de partenaires comme l'UNICEF, Tostan et le FUNEAP, a renforcé le niveau de participation des partenaires de mise en œuvre tout en optant pour l'approche basée sur les droits humains. Euh, je peux citer parmi les résultats que nous avons obtenus. Euh, le Sénégal dispose d'un cadre juridique protecteur des droits des enfants et des femmes et nous avons euh, euh, voté la loi 9905 qui interdit la pratique de l'excision. Nous avons notre système de santé euh, qui intègre dans sa euh, politique et son protocole l'abandon de l'excision. Nous avons l'existence de cadres de coordination à tous les niveaux, au niveau national, au niveau régional, départemental et local. Dans le cadre de la mise en œuvre de la stratégie nationale de protection de l'enfant, ces pratiques néfastes, notamment l'excision, les mariages d'enfants, les violences faites aux filles, sont intégrées dans le paquet de services offerts aux communautés. Nous avons l'intégration des outils de plaidoyer pour l'abandon de l'excision, nous avons également le soutien des religieux, et c'est important. Euh, euh, nous avons des communautés qui ont fait une déclaration publique d'abandon de l'excision. Et à ce jour, 6 000 communautés ont déclaré avoir abandonné la pratique de l'excision et plus de 11 000 jeunes, filles et garçons bénéficient des actions d'éducation aux droits humains à travers le programme de renforcement des capacités communautaires. Alors, il est important après la mise en œuvre de ce premier plan d'action, de tirer des leçons. Et parmi les leçons apprises, nous avons euh, l'autonomisation des femmes et des communautés pratiquantes peut aider dans le changement de comportement en vue d'abandonner la pratique des MGF. Nous avons l'éducation, l'insertion socio-économique des jeunes filles et leur responsabilisation peut contribuer fortement à l'abandon de ces pratiques néfastes. Euh, parmi également les leçons apprises, c'est l'implication des communautés par la responsabilisation des structures communautaires dans la mise en œuvre du programme. Il y a également la nécessité de disposer d'assurances de ressources financières, matérielles et humaines pour fournir davantage de services. Voilà en ramassé ce que je voudrais dire sur l'expérience du Sénégal en matière de lutte contre les mutilations génitales féminines. Je vous remercie. Merci. Merci. Merci bien, Monsieur Njai. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is going to be Dr. Ben Chislagi. Uh, he's now the Director of Monitoring, Evaluation, Research and Learning at Tostan International, which is an NGO. Before he joined Tostan, he conducted uh, a research study called the Community Empowerment Programme, along with Jerry Mackey, who's here and who will answer questions later, and Diane Gillespie, and Dr. Gislagi is going to talk to us about that program. Thank you. Um, one of the things we knew about the program is that it had results linked to social change. One of these results was the abandonment of traditional harmful practices. But very little was known about the process, about how community members, what motivated community members for collective action and uh, um, community change. This is a major qualitative study, uh, both in time that devoted to it, it took us five years, uh, the amount of data collected, hundreds of interviews and videos, and the importance of its findings. Today, we wish to preview five of these findings because we believe that you will find these findings particularly interesting, and uh, we're pretty sure that you will find them particularly relevant for your work. The first of these findings is that um, values deliberation that is the discussion about individual and collective values motivate the revision of harmful social practices. And why is that important? That is important because social practices very often embody community values. So discussion about changing the practices might be seen by community members as a discussion about changing the values, threatening the values. The liberation about what my and yours values are, the, sh the values we share instead, we assure community members on the desire to hold the values in place and offers new opening to new ways of embodying those values, which is the reconsideration of old and new practices. 
uh, the participants we studied, the delibera deliberation was framed within the international human rights framework. And what we found in particular is that international human rights blended with local values and aspirations because community members understood international human rights in local terms, in lo through local values and the local experiences. New aspiration called for, for a revision of existing social norms. But here's when, here is tricky. Why is it tricky? Well, what we found is that revision of social norms uh, um, requires the creation of a public sphere open to all. In the villages we studied, we, uh, we found a public sphere confined to the male elders. And that was problematic because that narrow public sphere kept certain people to whom norms were detrimental to participate in the discussion about changing those norms, right? So what we found is that for there to be community improvements and beneficial social norms revision, the public sphere must be open to all in the community. Community members in our villages learn how to contribute to public deliberation. In the Tostan program, those women, like that woman that you see, uh, they learn how to play a public role. They rehearsed that role with one another in class and then carried it to the entire vill uh, village. Note the woman who is uh, pointing out the key points in, uh, that she finds relevant in the creation. Third finding. Well, one has to work with the entire social network. Because social norms bind people in a group together, you cannot plan an intervention that only works with individual people. Um, and in the same, you have to find strategies to work with the entire group. In a similar way, not only one has to work with the entire social network, only one also has to work with the entire web of knowledge. Why? Well, your, belie my, your beliefs about something are held in place by a web of knowledge elements. A program that targets only one element of that knowledge is, is doomed to be failed, to fail because the rest of the web responds to keeping the belief in place. Uh, which take us, and certain of those beliefs are beliefs about self. And when beliefs about self change, new aspiration about self emerge and about how one can contribute to change in one's life and his or her village, motivating further change. Uh, beliefs about self include social uh, gender, gender norms. And what we found to be critical, fourth finding and second last, is that for gender, gender norms exist because they grant peace and security in the community. In the villages we studied, gender norms was conciliatory. And that was important because uh, conflictual discussions might backfire. Contentious disputation would not uh, bring to a relaxed way of understanding norms that actually foster peace and security. Fifth and last finding, well, what we found is that community aspiration to realize human rights for all actually challenged what there were inherited models of child protection. So children's future widened in parents' eyes. And parents started thinking about their children not only as um, uh, having as only option replicating their the parents' life, but they started thinking about that as having a wider future, an open future to everyone. There is so much more in the report. We, the report is publicly available. We really hope that you will um, give, give your feedback, and uh, we appreciate any of it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chislaga. We have two speakers for you now, together. Uh, first of all is Dr. Annabel Arulka, who's uh, sitting next to me, a social scientist. She's going to talk about the Behan Hiwan project, which is um, Amaric for Light for Eve, I believe, isn't it? And it was a pilot project, piloted for two years in Ethiopia. Uh, her colleague, Ato Halilul Siyum, is from the, the Ministry of Women, Children and Youth Affairs in Ethiopia. And we will talk about how the government took up uh, that pilot project. So, Dr. Arulka, over to you, first of all. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. So, um, me and my co-presenter, Ato Halilul, We'll discuss a program to prevent child marriage in Ethiopia known as Burhani Hiwan, as well as the follow-on project to scale up that approach known as Finoti Hiwat. Uh, this was implemented in the Amhara region, which is the second largest region in Ethiopia and also the region with the highest rate of uh, child marriage. So about 15 years ago, we started the program uh, Burhani Hiwan, which as the facilitator said, means Light for Eve in Amharic, and it was the name given to the project by the community. It had dual objectives, so the objectives 
were both to delay the age at marriage among girls at high risk of an early marriage, as well as to support girls who were already victims of child marriage. And it was a partnership between the Ethiopian Ministry of Women, Children, and Youth Affairs, the Amhara Regional Bureau of that same ministry, the UNFPA, and the Population Council. And this program was designed, uh, the program was designed based on formative research as well as consultations with the government um, as well as community leaders. And the four components that are listed in this slide were designed to address the various drivers of the, of the practice. So for example, we did community conversations to address social norms. We provided school materials to address the economic barriers to schooling and to take advantage of the protective effect of schooling. We also offered a conditional cash transfer in the form of a GOAT to families who kept their girls unmarried in, in school for the two year duration. And then we also had mentoring groups which were mainly, um, per, the main participants were married girls. Burhani Hewan was also had a quasi-experimental research design. So we undertook population-based surveys both before and after two years of implementation. And it was extremely effective particularly among younger adolescents. So among girls aged 10 to 14 in the pilot site, they were one-tenth as likely to be married and three times more likely to be in school uh, compared to girls in the control site. And among married girls, they were three times more likely to be using family planning. This Burhani Hewan really did demonstrate many years ago that it is possible to do a modest project to delay the age at marriage in a relatively short period of time. But as a package of interventions, it was difficult for us to sort of tease out which of these components was the most influential in the marriage uh, delays that we saw. And, th and that raised lingering concerns about the complexity and the scalability and also the cost of this project. So as a result, we moved to a second phase uh, of learning based on the, the lessons and also the questions that were generated out of the first phase. So now in the second iteration of learning, we're taking those four components that we tested under Burhani Hewan and separately testing them in different districts of different African countries where child marriage is prevalent. So uh, not only in Amhara region, we're also working in Tanzania and Burkina Faso. Like Burhani Hewan, we're testing the impact of these separate interventions um, at the population level use, using population-based surveys. Um, and very importantly, we're tracking costs of the interventions. So we'll be able to tell our partners and governments what is the cost of these interventions, as well as tracking the coverage, which is it's very important to uh, reach a large percentage of eligible girls. Um, with that being said, I'm going to hand over to my co-presenter, Otto Haile Alul. I also have some documents uh, for anyone who's interested in the work that we have presented. Thank you very much. This is the clicker. Thank you very much. Um, I will continue from Dr. Anabel. Uh, and stopped. Uh, my part will focus on Funotehot uh, in the Child Marriage Program, which is um, a scale up program from Brahani Juan uh, pilot model. Um, it is uh, a five years uh, program, started in uh, 2012, uh, and its goal is to uh, delay the marriages of adolescent girls in, Amha, in East and West Gwajam of the Amara Regional States. And uh, it approach is a scale-up program, government-led partnership and community-owned program. It is highly characterized by uh, community ownership, community capacity enhancement program. Um, it's focus on sustainability, value for money, and uh, government capacity enhancement, especially towards ensuring sustainability, partnership, uh, and ownership. 
as I said, capa uh, community ownership and community uh, empowerment. Uh, the other approach is utilization of the existing structures, both government, non-state actors, and community structures. We have different structures, which you have heard in the morning. The health extension workers, we have the structure for uh, women development armies. Uh, we have over 426,000 women development armies, which consists of uh, over uh, 10 million uh, women one fourth of being in Amara region. The, the program components are mainly, we have four components, the uh, community level and the school-based uh, uh, component, and the uh, strategic engagement and the communication, capacity building for government institutions, uh, and evidence-based and knowledge sharing learning is. Uh, the fo the uh, goal being uh, empowering uh, girls and uh, harmonized or synergized multidimensional social norm transformation. The program coordination uh, component, in terms of program coordination, we have uh, at national level, we have the uh, in child marriage steering committee which is composed of uh, different uh, non-government organizations, UN agencies, uh, governmental organizations, uh, and so on. And also we have the National Alliance to End Child Marriage, which is the product of this program. The National Alliance uh, to End Child Marriage, again, has brought uh, a number of uh, partners and stakeholders, including government, non-government, and UN agencies, and international donor agencies like DFID. Uh, at regional level, um, we have the uh, regional uh, government institutions uh, and also Orada based uh, community forums. And another uh, coordinating body is the uh, uh, girls' clubs, which are established at uh, school levels. In terms of achievements, this program has contributed to our strengths in the policy, legal, and strategic framework and context is. It is during the lifetime of this program that we have developed and adopted the national strategy on harmful traditional practices against women and children. The sense of taboo, the silence and the taboo uh, has been uh, started to be broken down and now child marriage, the end child marriage and uh, FGM has started to be uh, a community agenda rather, of, rather than uh, an agenda by the government or an agenda by other uh, civil society organizations, we have uh, becoming successful in making it a community agenda. The other uh, achievement is we have strengthened the partnership among government institutions and the community, the community structures. Uh, this program has contributed towards the reduction in terms of child marriage rate, the rate of child marriage. As you have heard in the morning, we had 33.1%, but now we have reached 8% uh, uh, especially for those who uh, are below the age of 15. The other achievement is religious institutions are instrumental in this process. Earlier, child marriage was given religious justifications, but now religious institutions have become instrumental in the prevention and uh, abandonment of child marriage. Sir, I need you to summarize to your final point now, please. Okay, thank you. Um, in terms of community achievements, a lot of there, we have a lot of achievements. Uh, in terms of community engagement, we have the collective decision making and also diffusion and experience sharing among community members within uh, the, the zone and outside uh, those uh, uh, targeted zones. Now we have uh, witnessed some cavaliers which are uh, to zero tolerated to uh, child marriage. Um, we have also school-based intervention. 
in, the, in that case, uh, our school enrollment has been increased, and those uh, outside the school were started to uh, return to schools. Uh, girls' empowerment is as the, as the center, and uh, girls becoming vocal in uh, 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 challenging the, the, the status quo and, and the, child, the, the child marriage. And also we have the social protection uh, component, which is providing school materials for girls and also uh, 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 revolving fund and financial assistance to those parents of uh, poor girls. Uh, in terms of challenges, uh, we have still three uh, challenges. That is limited capacity in terms of implementing such, such large programs at grassroots levels. And also we have a problem of uh, data and uh, limited resources to uh, scale up such uh, community-based programs uh, into different parts of the, uh, the, the region and also uh, the country. Thank you very much. I appreciate your brevity, Atusi, and thank you very much there. Um, I want to get to our last speaker, uh, Hekate Papadaki from the Rosa Fund, one of three NGOs that launched the Tackling FGM initiative in the UK to do grassroots work, and we've seen how successful they've been. She's going to talk about that for a couple of minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. First of all, um, to point out the difference Obviously, with the other speakers, we're working with uh, the diaspora community in the UK. We heard on Monday that it's estimated that we have 137,000 women living with FGM in the UK and approximately 60,000 girls born to those women. Uh, obviously, since we're working with migrant communities, we have to bear in mind they are dispersed around the country and it's not just one community. Uh, they all have different cultural justifications for practicing FGM. Therefore, we can't use the same approach with all of them. There's no one approach fits all model. Uh, the other thing to bear in mind is that migrant communities, uh, especially when they first arrive in a country, they feel an increased need to maintain their traditions as a, as a way of protecting their identities. So the Tackling FGM initiative has worked directly with uh, over 10,000 members of communities affected by FGM in the UK. And uh, an external evaluation conducted by Options Consultancy in 2013 found that there has been um, an increased cha an change in attitudes compared to 2010 when we started our work towards greater rejection of FGM. And you can pick up a summary of the report over there. We have also provided training for more than a thousand frontline professionals who are now more able to identify and support girls at risk from FGM. Uh, we have also raised awareness amongst the wider public in the UK and we have driven the political changes that uh, will help protect thousands more girls. So what we have, I, I want to focus on what we have found, learned, that what can be replicated. So uh, through our work, um, I suppose I should use that. We have found that the, there's three essential elements for any campaign to end FGM. Firstly, uh, it is community engagement. Uh, secondly, it's a successful communication strategy. This doesn't seem to be working. And thirdly, it's political will. Ah, oh, okay. Right, brilliant. So uh, the initiative has led community engagement in the UK. And we have found that for community engagement to be successful, it is essential to be flexible. Because uh, as we said, we work with very different communities and there was very little knowledge of what works when we started. So we allowed our projects to find their own way and to try different things until they became experts in using different techniques and arguments. It's also very important to utilize traditional social networks because as I said, uh, the population here of migrant communities is dispersed around the country. So all our funded projects uh, recruited um, community champions from affected communities who brought with them, apart from the expertise in reaching communities, they brought with them their social networks, their neighbors, their friends, and the families, and allowed us to widen our reach. And thirdly, and uh, the most important part, I would say, is that the initiative has been expert-led. 
So we have engaged survivors of FGM at all levels. They have been our consultants, uh, they have been managers and frontline workers, and most importantly, they have been our spokespeople. And because survivors are the experts in the field, and they are the ones who have the ability to denormalize FGM in the eyes of their communities, it is essential that they are always engaged. So moving on to the second point, a successful communication strategy. In the UK, survivors and young people from affected communities have led a very successful media strategy and uh, there, there's not been a week where FGM has not been in the news for the past couple of years. And this attention has uh, helped mount political pressure. And I'm going to move on quickly to the third point, which is political will. And I'm rushing now because I can see the clock flashing. <laughs> so I could have used a picture of today's summit instead of this one uh, to demonstrate political will. And obviously, it's not possible to end FGM without the government putting the structures in place to protect children. So we have ensured that the knowledge from the ground is communicated to the government. And uh, we have worked with government departments that wanted to work with us from the start. And we have continuously lobbied those departments that did not recognize that FGM was their responsibility. And uh, our key demands are increasingly being met. And today we're hearing that there will be training for frontline professionals, which was uh, one of our key demands. And we, they have, there will also be recording or, and reporting of FGM cases in health setting. But we are still asking for services for survivors of FGM, and we're still asking for funding for grassroots prevention. However, the government is increasingly recognizing that FGM is a violence against women issue and a child protection issue. So what I want, to take, what I want you to take from today is that you need all three elements to lead a successful campaign. And I've brought with me a simple guide for donors, if there's anyone uh, in the room, that you can take with you about uh, advice for how to mount um, an effective campaign. Thank you. We have about five or six minutes for questions, so if anybody else, anybody would like to ask a question, please raise your hands. I will call on you. We have microphones available. Uh, simple, short, targeted questions, please. You, sir, you, sir first of all. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk. Okay, ask a question. Uh, um, my name is Alfred Williams from Sierra Leone. Uh, the Gas Summit is a very good program that brings young people together to discuss about the FGM that affects them in their community. What I want to know is, how will you support the Gas Summit to be in Sierra Leone that will fit the Global Girl Summit. Thank you. Who would you like to ask that to? Anyone. Anyone. Well, it seems, who would like to answer that? Monsieur? Um, je crois que c'est une Au-delà de cette, euh, cette rencontre qui se tient ici, il va falloir qu'au niveau des pays où le phénomène est très prégnant, qu'il puisse y avoir ce genre de rencontre. Euh, nous, au Sénégal, nous envisageons au retour d'organiser une réunion de restitution avec l'ensemble des acteurs pour aller vers un plan d'action. Il est important également que ce genre d'initiative soit soutenu dans son pays. Je crois que l'initiative doit venir de ces autorités, des autorités du Kenya qui doivent prendre l'initiative d'organiser ce genre de rencontre, à mon avis. Uh, next question, um, madam. Um, Mary Healy, Human Dignity Foundation. I'd like to ask Sonali what Breakthrough's biggest challenge has been in scaling up, because you know, there are so many great community initiatives around that work well and they hit a wall when they try to scale. So what's been the biggest challenge? What is the biggest challenge? Uh, thank you, Mary, for that question. I think one of our biggest 
challenge is uh, that there is, uh, while there is clear understanding about the law, because India has a very clear law on prevention of uh, child marriage, uh, but the community seems to accept it. There is an overarching acceptance, and uh, if there is uh, anybody who gets their child married early, nobody complains. There is no access to a formal system. So this has been the challenge. So while there is a law, there is no way in which we can ramp up a legal response. It has to be a social response. And therefore, the same community, how do you engage them to ramp at scale? And you're not talking one to one here. You're talking to a huge number of people. And it's not about going into one sort of school or one sort of village and talking to a few influencers. You really need to bring everybody into the conversation. And there is a pushback. And therefore, when we build up a campaign, how do you connect the 60,000 feet to the zero level? I think that is the spectrum that you're talking about. It's not just working at at the ground level, but how do you engage? And I think today is an example of 60,000, and how do you take it back to your communities and bring that link together? Okay, great. Uh, lady there? Yes. Bear of uh, Girls Not Brides. My question is general, but specifically for the last speaker from the UK, when you talked about the role of the government uh, and the importance of that. And, uh, and I'm saying this because in our experience in Sudan, we have worked a lot at the community level and uh, in terms of raising the awareness of the community and uh, mobilizing people. But because of the lack of the commitment of the government, uh, not only just the lack of commitment, but also uh, putting in place legislations and laws that legalize child marriage and not criminalize FGM, whatever we do at the community is not going anywhere. And not only that, even now, the international actors, including the donors, are ignoring us because we are labeled as organizations working against the government. And um, even when I'm, I look, yeah, yeah, Please, madam, yeah, please yeah. ask the question. So my question is how can we uh, really work for uh, movements and for upscaling what we do without or, or with uh, our effort offset by what the government is I completely doing. understand your, the issue. I mean, it has been the case for many years in, in the UK when working on FGM. And I think there's two things that have changed that. First of all, it's been the survivors who have acted as spokespeople and the media stood behind them. And that built, helped build a lot of political pressure uh, in the last couple of years. That's, that's the main difference. And uh, in terms of the initiative, my post has been set specifically to communicate the knowledge from the ground to the government. So I kind of bridge that gap. So you do need that structure. Um, the difference with the initiative is that these four funders who have come together and all the projects are working, are meeting together and they're sharing learning. So we kind of have one voice that can be communicated more easily. Okay, we have time for one more very quick question. Is that Raj Kumar there? Yeah, please, very quick question. Thank you so much, I'm not going to take background. Just directed to India team and Ethiopia. My uh, question is the issues of dowry, you know, like you already know that dowry is the one of the strongest root cause of child marriage. And through its media mobilization, whether whatever the, you know, intervention you implement through RCT, why you are not making front, uh, the issue of dowry in front, simultaneously addressing the issue of dowry. Unless and until you issue the dowry, child marriage is not going to reduce, at least in the Southeast Asia. This is to Sonali. Sonali. Okay. Yeah. And what, uh, for the Ethiopia, what's the you know, okay, uh, the difference answer, over there? Rajkumar, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I think that's really a very, very critical question because uh, when the girl gets married early, the dowry is lower. So the dowry keeps going up with the age of the girl. So that becomes also a reason why girls get married early. So one of the biggest push in the program that we are doing in terms of a shift in norm is not to save for the dowry of the girl, but to save for the education of the girl. I think we really need to shift that thinking. So in our program, it's not really an anti-dowry campaign, it's how families perceive the value of the girl. And that is so critical because here in, in, in India, 
the girl is not something that you want to value. You don't want to invest in her education because A, you have to get her married, pay the dowry, and then when she's productive, she goes to some other household and gets productive. So you really need to shift how young girls are perceived in their families and communities. So for us, the big push is to really get families to save for the education in terms of money for the education of the girls. So that's the push of our program. We have run out of time for questions, I'm afraid, and for this session. Uh, I'd like to thank my panel very much for taking part. And we've, heard, we've heard today that marriage is a social issue and there needs to be a social response. We've heard that communities can be the biggest problem, but they also can be, must be, the greatest solution. And I hope you're going to leave this session with some ideas of the challenges and also the opportunities of scaling up community involvement from hundreds of thousands of people to millions and millions more. Thank you very much. Thank you.